The rivers in China are home to one of the largest salamanders, nay, one of the largest amphibians in the entire world. Blending in with the rocks that line the riverbeds, the Chinese giant salamander spends its entire life beneath the rushing waters. This long-lived wriggle monster can breathe, see, and even heal itself using nothing but its unique skin. It just goes to show that skin care can sometimes be a matter of life, death, and taxonomy. Welcome back to Life, Death, and Taxonomy. It's your 30 minutes of interesting animal information. I'm Joe. And I'm Carlos. Thank you to Cassie for the creation of our theme song. To hear more of Cassie's music, please search Cassie Michelle on YouTube or Spotify. And thank you to Johanna for the creation of this week's artwork. To check that out, you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter at LD, LD Taxonomy. Or visit us at our home on the web at LDTaxonomy.com. And a very special thank you to our patrons, to Tristan Taylor, Jesse Raspolich, Kel Raspolich, Paul Chomo, and Richard Kaspar. Thank you so much for your support. It's greatly appreciated. Thanks for helping us keep the lights on. And today we're talking about an animal whose name, whose official name, violates the order force rule of grammar, and I hate that, but more on that later. <laughs> I know what you're talking about, <laughs> but it, it, this, is, this is something I feel is often violated. It shouldn't be. Um, sounds wrong yeah it does it does like sound off but anyway why don't you go ahead and and uh and rip off that band-aid what are we talking about <laughs> we're talking about R rip, rip rip off that uh pink large band-aid <laughs> we're talking about the chinese giant salamander my greek fat big wedding <laughs> <laughs> Did you see? Did you hear what I did with the band aid thing? I was being clever. My lar no. the the pink oh. large band aid. Oh yeah, yeah, the pink large band aid. It's like uh, no. Yeah. So the order of force rule is the order of um, adjectives before a noun. So like my big fat Greek wedding. And if you speak English natively, you probably know innately a lot of like the rules. Without knowing the rules. So, like, everyone is like, yeah, why does my fat Greek big wedding sound wrong? Because it is wrong. There's a rule that adjectives have to come in a specific order. And origin, like Chinese, is usually very close to the noun. And giant, which is size, is first or second, something like that. So it should be the giant Chinese salamander. But it's the Chinese giant salamander. I think a lot of I, I think the general um, rule that people tend to adhere to, which ends up working, is general to specific. Chinese is very specific. Giant is just uh, is just a, its size. It's more mm -hmm. it's more general. There are, are giant things can be anywhere. Chinese things are in one place. So. Uh, and just like big is very general, fat is much more specific, and then Greek is very specific. So that's why that yeah. goes in that order. Well, that that's a that's a helpful general rule. But it real it the order is opinion size, age, shape, color, origin, material, and purpose. Yeah, it took me forever to remember King, Kingdom Phylum class order family yeah. genus species. There's no way I'm remembering what you just. Well, said. you don't. You don't need like most Ameri most native English speakers don't even need to know the rule, and they'll get it right almost every time. Um, and I think if you follow the broad to specific thing, you're, yeah. you'll you'll do just fine. I, I remember uh, we used to work with a guy from Russia, and he asked he asked us one time. How do you know what the order adjectives are supposed to go in is? And we were all like, uh, oh, I have no idea. <laughs> and we just know. We only we just know it. We don't know it's, why we know it. You, it's funny when you when you're whenever you try to explain um English to someone who doesn't speak it uh fluently, 
you realize how how much you just naturally understand or intuit without act, really knowing. Like I remember having at one point to exp someone asked me what sure meant. And I was like you know what? <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> I, I mean I know. I'm I'm very sure. Um but then like then what is positive be like what what like how do you explain that to someone who doesn't like the, the concept of not and not just like being secure or positive about something but like also affirmative it means you know you want to go grab a bite to eat sure you know all this stuff anyway we should cut all this out <laughs> this is all, <laughs> like this, is all this is all not not uh relevant to the grammar the, talk the giant Chinese salamander. Well, the reason, let's bring it back to the salamander. The reason I think it's giant, Chinese giant salamander is because there's more than one giant salamander. One of them is in Japan. One of them is in China. So I think it's like, oh, it's the giant salamander. Which one? Is it, is it the one from Japan or is it the one from China? Oh, it's the Chinese giant salamander. This would all be fixed if we just went back to saying of things. So it's the giant salamander of China, the giant yeah. salamander of Japan, yeah. like uh, like how like how Spanish does things. Romantic languages. We got we got a little romance in our English. I don't yeah. I don't take I don't I don't even speak my English unless it's got a little bit of romance in it. <laughs> Do you uh, but want to have names for this thing yeah, besides so, the horrible one that violates grammar rules? It's it, it's also known as babe the baby fish. Which is, I in my opinion, more wrong <laughs> than giant, Chinese giant, giant salamander. It's not um, small, cute, or a fish. Right. I don't know if you're going to talk about it later. Why it's called that. Are you going to? Mm -mm. Um. Okay. Well, apparently, as um, in their infant stages, they make this... Uh, squ squealing sound that um in China in Chinese they they have translated this to mean infant fish because it reminds them of the sound of a of a baby. Ah, uh, so it's not a baby fish; it's a baby fish. Right, so they like just the way that it the the sounds that it makes sounds like a baby. So. Um, it's also not a fish, right? But right. Yeah. Not a fish just at all. This this salamander has been around for a very long time, and the Chinese language has not changed a ton in thousands of years, which is pretty unique for a language. So, uh, you know, they the things that they called it back then tend to you know translate over or stick around. And also, Chinese is an interesting language when it comes to just taking words and jamming them together and having them mean entirely new concepts. Like, what's a blizzard? It's a uh, violent snow wind. What's a computer? It's electric brain. <laughs> um, Do you know so what America is? It's um, beautiful country. Yeah. And China is middle country. And England is English country. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had to know all that stuff when I was there. Um, anyway, so yes, it's called the baby fish. We're going to call it here the aquatic apex amphibian, the see no evil, heal no evil, breathe no evil, and Dr. Good and Slimy. Hmm. Cool. Yep. Good. Um, the doctor is in. It's a good doctor. Would would you like to know what kingdom it is in? I I I'll hazard a I can hazard a guess. Go ahead. Animalia. That's I, correct. That's all I can think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, uh, nursing school victory. <laughs> it's a kingdom you know, love, and are in the kingdom Animalia. It's in the phylum Chordata. It's in the class Amphibia. It's in the order Urodella. Urodella. That's Salabandis. Um, Salabandi. <laughs> the family is Cryptobranchiidae. It's a long word, are, but 
It was a lot easier Aquatic to salamanders, s- commonly known as the giant salamanders. Uh huh. And the genus is Andreas. 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 San uh, San Andreas. And the Saint species Andrew? is uh, Davinanus. Davinanus. David. Div- Davi- Davidianus? Yeah, Branch Davidianus. <laughs> yeah, it's a Branch Davidianus. Uh, and Andreas Davidianus. So it's Andrew David. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's just his first and middle name. <laughs> it's just, Andrew it's, David Salamander. This is, this is, If, if if there was ever like an aristocratic wealthy salamander that would, to- that would that's definitely his name all right well yeah uh since we're in the business of naming things it's time for my favorite part of the show critter groups the part of the show where i ask you joe a question that question is the same every time what is the name of a group of this animal or what is the term of venery or what is the collective noun it all means the same thing if you saw a group of salamanders, I don't think we've done a salamander yet. Hmm. Um, we've done geckos. We've done lots of lizards. But I don't think we've frogs. done. Uh, yeah, lots of frogs. I don't think we've done a salamander yet. Um, so if you saw a group of salamanders, would you say it's A, a pittance of salamanders, B, a maelstrom of salamanders, C, a gouging of salamanders, or D, a simmer of salamanders. Maelstrom. Pittance, maelstrom, gouging, and simmer. Well, it's critically endangered, so there is just a pittance of them left. <laughs> um, why not a pittance of salamanders? Final answer. Eh. Incorrect. The answer mm. is maelstrom. Hmm. For no reason. <laughs> is this Absolutely. Like a, is it like a yokai of the storm or something? Maybe that's not in China. Japanese one. <laughs> yeah, they don't. Have, they don't. I guess. And it's it's not just this. It's salamanders. Like maybe this I would call a maelstrom, but all salamanders, most of them are tiny little lizard things. <laughs> I would not call any of them a maelstrom. I would, ve- I would a, l- a lot sooner call like a giant squid a maelstrom <laughs> or a a whale. <laughs> a maelstrom of whales makes a lot more sense to me. But whatever. That's it's a pretty cool term of entering given to a pretty cool animal. Yeah. Speaking of that, would you like to know what it looks like? Yeah. Um, it looks like the stuff, the, the, the like the lizard things that you fight in Elden Ring a couple times, only it's not covered in stardust or lava. So. What? Uh, the salamander has a large head, small eyes, and wrinkled dark skin. It has a broad, flat head with a wide mouth and round, lidless eyes, as well as um, a line of paired tubercles circling its head and throat hmm i love me some good tubercles hmm. uh they come in several colors including dark brown reddish brown black brownish tones and with a mottled speckled pattern candy apple red is not available uh and insurance have- is higher on those yeah that's true um there have been reports of albinos which are white or orange in color. That'd be fun. Orange is not what I would have expected for an albino. I would think like if you if you were trying to print some brown and you ran out of ink, you would come out orange. I think you'd just come out with tan, beige. Uh, nah. Well, maybe you have a lot of reds and not a lot of blues. That's true. Okay, well... That brings us to its relative size. It's called Giant. How giant is it? Welcome to the Beloved Measure Up segment, the official listener's favorite part of the show, the part of the show that's introduced by you. When you send an audio of yourself saying, singing, or cheering the words to measure up into ldtaxonomy.com, it's also the part of the show when we present the animal size and dimensions in relatable terms through a quiz that's fun for the whole family. 
we do have a measure up intro anew from Melissa, who has the team on her back for the last three weeks. And now this is the fourth week. Go, Melissa. Um, and it's the last of the uh, boon she's bestowed upon us. So and it's it's been a, a delightful reign of ter- of of fan a fan <laughs> of the reign of fan. That's my second favorite Sean Connery movie. There's Reign of Fire and then Reign of Fan. Uh, but if you are waiting to uh, maybe send in a measure up when we really needed it next week, we will have none if it's not for you. That's right. You, John, you need to send in one next week. I bet you. I bet there you must be a John. Freaked a John out right now. But based on the people that have of their own volition sent us in measure ups, it's probably more like a Kim or um, a Joan, you know? Joan. Hmm. Interesting. Oh, meaning, uh, it seems like the the ladies are the are the the ones that are uh, stepping up in this regard. So we we gotta we gotta appeal to the boys. The boys gotta send in their measure ups. You gotta you gotta you gotta pull your weight around here. Come on, John. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Without further ado, the listener's favorite part of the show. Give me those digits. <laughs> what? <laughs> She needs the digits. Oh my gosh. I was not prepared for that. <laughs> I was prepared for my favorite fan in the <laughs> to hear that in the background. <laughs> but I was not prepared for the digits. The digits are requested. The numbers. <laughs> Can I have the numbers, them? numbers, <laughs> Mason. Can we get them? Can we get uh, the numbers? That's a good one. I like that. Digits. The numbers. We're talking numbers. Ready? Sure, yeah. <laughs> De- derail. Are you... What? Remember? Did you ever... I think with that SNL skit where it's like, can I have your number? Can I have it? Can I have the 10 <laughs> digits that make up your number? My name is Derail. Yes. It's like spelled Daryl, but pronounced Derail. <laughs> uh, so let's... Uh, speaking of um, digits and numbers... You've got five more of those things in terms of percentage that's going towards both of these measure up questions because Melissa has deigned to send us uh, this measure up intro. So thank you, Melissa, for this fourth uh, above and beyond uh, measure ups uh, introduction. Let's talk thank about you. length. They're between 1.15 meters and 3.8 feet. How many giant salamand- Chinese giant salamanders go into the length of the Long March, the longest recorded march in military history? Is that under Napoleon? I'll give you a one more percent, so a total of 6%, if you can guess what country the long march took place in or what country was involved i guess i'm going to go with my previous guess and that it was france final guess sure yeah that percentage has gone down the drain darn it uh, here's a hint. The Long March was a military retreat of the first Red Army, the vanguard of the Chinese Communist Party in the 1930s. I the should March- have guessed that it had something to do with China. I don't know why I was. I forgot that you do that. These are sometimes related. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I should have uh, just March- said China. I would have probably been right. <laughs> it's a good guess to just go with whatever the, the animals from. The march took a full year from October 1934 to October 1935, actually over a year um, by a few days. And uh, it started in Yudu in the province of Jiangxi, 
to Yanang in Shangzi. Shane's Shanzi. X's or Z sounds right. The retreat was forced under pressure from the nationalist forces of the Kuomintang, which are the, uh, which are the, I think, third and fourth red armies. Thousand miles. Done. This is they easy. They would walk 1,000 miles just to yeah. not see. Just to fall, just Kiam- to be the army that walked 1,000 miles to fall down at your door. Kuomintang. Battle with Kuomintang. At your Kuomintang. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so 3.8 feet. They can get up to be six feet long, though. That's that's a very large salamander, but average yeah. is not there. Yeah, we're gonna go with three point eight. Yes, one point four million salamanders. Final answer. Yeah. The correct answer is seven point seven million. That is a long way to go <laughs> the march was nine thousand kilometers or five thousand six hundred miles goodness gracious historians are uh at odds as to whether this was caused by military brilliance or a cavalcade of military blunders but either way it is uh, definitely a feat of human kind to walk that walk an army that long. I'm trying to see how what the length of what the width of the United States is. So it's 2,900 miles to get from New York to San Francisco. Mm-hmm. They did that almost twice. They walked from New York to San Francisco and back. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is bananas. Let's talk about weight. They're between 25 and 30 kilograms or 55 to 66 pounds. Pretty big for a salamander. Up to 110. Mm-hmm. How many salamanders go into the weight of a fully loaded Republic P-47 Thunderbolt? The heaviest single-engine plane in World War II. How does this relate to China? Because I was ta- doing research about the Long March and started thinking about uh, 1930s and 40s aircraft. Because uh, during the Long March, they were dodging uh, uh, reconnaissance planes. But here's a hint. This is not a Chinese fighter. This fighter was produced by the United States company Republic Aviation. It was capable of carrying 2,500 pounds of payload. And we're talking fully loaded here. This is a nacho with cheese. And jalapenos. Mm Mm-hmm. And onions. And beef. And sour cream. sour, Sour cream, yeah. And pineapple salsa. No. Yeah. I'm addicted to pineapple salsa salsa now. I I can't go back to regular stuff. I like a mango salsa with just a a, a chip dipped into it, but not with all of that other savory goodness. All the all the the trappings. And I I can't explain it. I don't know why I I like it because usually I don't like including fruit into savory, savory things, but this works. Do you like a pineapple on a pizza? Now, I won't turn it down, but I'd prefer if it didn't have a pineapple Same. on it. Same. I, I feel like you have to choose one side or the other. Like you either like disgusted <laughs> and, and offended by yeah, the you're, idea you're, of it. You're either personally offended by the by the, the concept of it. Or, or you want to wolf it down at light speed. Every or it's single the only time pizza you like. It. Yeah. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm, in, I'm about as indifferent as I can be. Yeah. When it comes to pizza, um, it's like, do you want pepper on? Do you want like crushed like black pepper on your pizza? It's like, I sh- sure, I guess. <laughs> okay. I'd rather have a pineapple than an olive on a pizza. I'll, I'll save an olive across the room. <laughs> <laughs> 
and then walk over there and step on it so that it gets like mashed into the carpet because I don't and want that on my pizza. I want it in the carpet. And then quickly clean it up so that my wife doesn't get upset. <laughs> Because I'm not an animal just flicking, <laughs> flicking toppings. I'm not a crazed lunatic. Speaking of animals. 66 pounds going into a fighter carrying 2,500 pounds of payload. 151. Final answer. Yes. 151 salamanders. The correct answer was 242 salamanders. That is not that is not a, a nursing school victory even with my percentage. The thunderbolt was sixteen hundred pounds for eight tons, or no, eight sixteen thousand pounds. Sixteen thousand pounds or eight tons when it was fully loaded, making it the heaviest aircraft, single engine aircraft in um, in World War Two. Which I said. And then they're like, man, we should probably put another engine on this if we want to go any heavier. But it commanded the skies in its era. It was the it was the killer bee for sure. Man, we, I we just recently went to the Air Armament Museum in on in the Panhandle, and the, being a dogfighter in World War II must have been so nerve wracking. <laughs> <laughs> My gosh. Just considering how easy it is to take this things out of the sky and you're just in this hunk of metal that just there's there is no way this ends well for you if you get hit. So Well the the Thunderbolt had an armored um cockpit. Yeah, that doesn't do that much when you're your engine gets hit with a with flat cannon. Caliber. Yeah. Caliber bullets. A caliber. <laughs> And then, yeah, now you're in an armored cockpit that's headed for the ground. <laughs> so, um, in my I doff my cap to to people who fly planes for war because that is terrifying. Anyway, well, there you go, Melissa. Those are the digits, and we're Those sorry digits. your percentage bonus wasn't given to a victory. In this case. And I and it was it wasn't the best because I was I wasn't like super off, but I was way off. <laughs> <laughs> Not nursing school material. So no. let's talk fast facts before we get into the major fact. Um the Chinese giant salamander is a fully aquatic and nocturnal creature that lives in mountain streams in the Yangtze River basin. Big Big mountain man, right in the center of the l right of center. Rubio, right of center. Yeah. There you go. He's a Rubio. Uh, it's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> and Rubio is a classic mountain man. <laughs> uh, it's critically endangered because of habitat loss and over collection. Guess one of the things that has made it critically endangered. It's an animal. It's endangered. It's in China. What's Chinese superstitious traditional healing medicines. 100% correct. It is a delicacy and is used in traditional Chinese medicine. The one-two punch for an animal in China is is for the is for the people there to think that they get some sort of spiritual benefit from eating you. Uh Insects, millipedes, horsehair, horsehair worms, amphibians, uh, frogs, and salamanders, freshwater crabs, shrimp, fish, Asiatic water shrew. These are a few of my favorite things, and they're the things that this animal likes to eat. The Asiatic water shrew, for sure. Isn't it? Doesn't it just like send a shiver down your spine when a amphibian eats a mammal? <laughs> like uh like that the uh, um was it the welsh catfish or whatever that was um that eats, eats mammals <laughs> yeah. and we we talked about whether or not it eats humans you just it's it's not allowed if you're a frog if you're a salamander if you're a fish 
you aren't permitted to eat something with fur. Or like a tarantula bird or tra- oh, uh, like a, a, tra- eating a bird. it's the, the bir- same feeling bird eating goliath a, tarantula, an, tarantula an insect eating a bird yes yeah I'm, I'm th- no the, you're 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 punching above your weight class there <laughs> yeah. and it's and, horrifying yeah it is <laughs> i mean if you got to do it do it but you know, you know i don't i don't like to see it you don't like to see it um, but this would be like of, if the giant salam like the tr- the tarantula versus bird thing would be like if this giant salamander like ate a Rottweiler. <laughs> uh, like, oh, okay. Oh, uh, no. But speaking of things that you sh- really shouldn't be eating, it also likes to eat other of its own species quite mm. a lot. Don't you know you're endangered? Cut that out. Um, I don't think he knows. I don't think they he can't, told it. Oh, is it because they can't see very well, so they're not looking at the charts? Yeah, they have. They haven't seen their digits. <laughs> uh, so yeah, they can't see well. Um, but giant salamanders don't like the heat and will get out of the kitchen. In that, I mean, die in temperatures of ninety-five degrees or higher. Same. I don't know the uh, the Celsius for that, but we don't we don't do that here. I think it's like forty. Yeah, so high thirties. It's something right in the, in the middle. Something like, you know, Celsius is good for nothing, except for uh, except for cooking. All w- very very easily being able to know where freezing and boiling is. Yeah. So Celsius for cooking, uh, Kelvin for science, and Fahrenheit for temp- for weather temperature. For daily life. Yeah, because it means something when the temperature goes up by one. And you know what it means. You feel it. If the temperature um, goes up by one Celsius, you're definitely going to feel it. Well, yeah, but like you can fine tune with Fahrenheit. Yeah, so I guess like if you have a thermostat that only does in Celsius, like it's just that that is so uh, this goes swings wildly. <laughs> it's like I want it to be, you know, 25 degrees Celsius and then I bump it up to 26 I'm going to die of a heat stroke if I bump it down to 24 <laughs> everyone's going to freeze to death yeah. so it's goodness gracious we all have our purposes we don't have to pretend like uh, Celsius makes sense for the weather you can you can cut you can do the Fahrenheit English people we, we won't tell anyone uh, rest of the world yeah rest of the world we won't tell England rest of the world come come <laughs> Come over to the Fahrenheit land. Uh, females lay around 500 eggs, which are guarded by the male until the eggs hatch. Um, they have several courtship displays, including a belly bump. So if you watch a football game with a Chinese giant salamander and your team scores a touchdown, refrain from the old chest bump or they'll get ideas. Hmm. You don't want you don't want to be sending mixed signals to a Chinese giant salamander. You don't want to be leading them on. That's just rude. Yeah. You know? Young salamanders have gills until they reach three years old. They reach maturity around five years old. And they live for about sixty years. Undocumented claims, kind of like lies, say that salamanders <laughs> have reached two hundred years old. <laughs> but they are not credible. And are not considered credible sources. That is an old salamander, regardless. Mm-hmm. They look um, old, though. They look like they've been around for a long time. They're like like the Greenland shark. They just look weathered. They do, yeah. Um, that's all I got for that. All right, you ready for the major fact? I sure am. All right. Well, I told I, we were talking about it before the episode started that um, I had a story. To, I had an animal encounter story to tell, and I, I this was weeks ago, and I forgot to include it in any of the episodes. So I'm going to put it in here um, because you were there for it. I was there for it. So I was there for that th- three th- what was it, three weeks ago, uh, you came to my house. And uh, we went with everybody and the kids to the zoo. So we were there looking at all the animals that we've covered, like the cassowary and the uh, 
rhinos and the elephants Mm -hmm. and we were over near the uh, zabu land (laughs) we're over here where the where the um the the lemurs and everything are where the little leaping lemurs like to bounce and play yeah they actually do have the thing that zabumafu is it's not it is technically a lemur but it's not called a lemur it starts with an s i forgot what it's called um but anyway we were right there and a little baby squirrel comes out from uh from underneath a nearby bush and walks up to my f- my shoe and then climbs on top of my shoe and I was I had my son um I was like I I was standing over him and my son was like in between my my feet and he he, he punts this baby squirrel like a <laughs> foot or so um just like get away from me kind of thing he reacted like uh, everyone else w- like, should when a, a rodent approaches you and but you know, squirrels are babies. just uh, squirrels are so cute and baby squirrels are just the cutest um but he said no one's competing with me this day in terms of cuteness he's like this might have rabies um but anyway so the squirrel was not injured um because a two-year-old kicked it um but anyway it could climb back up my up on my shoe and and it started to climb up my leg and so like i put it on my hand and i picked it up and it was this baby squirrel was just on my arm and I'm, i'm thinking like oh it's a squirrel like climbing is its thing these things like run upside down on trees and stuff like that um it should be fine and it was like it, it didn't seem super steady on my arm. And then at one point, it just jumped off. I mean, I'm like 5'11-ish, 5, 5'11 and a half or so. So it just jumped off my arm and splatted on the ground. And Your didn't... arm was like maybe around four feet off the yeah, ground? Yeah, I was just holding it out. And it just did a belly flop on the ground. Oh, um, yeah. And like a, any a, a typical squirrel. Like could fall from that high, can fall from like twenty feet and like probably be fine. But yeah, they he, actually this one I, really belly flopped. But I read about it and they actually do this, like squirrel. This is something that squirrels do, which is belly flop on the ground. I don't know if it's supposed to if the the thing that they're trying to get away from is supposed to be like, oh, I guess it's dead. I'm gonna walk away. I uh, but I don't know. This is this is not abnormal behavior for a squirrel. But we were just like, oh my gosh, this thing is just like, like maimed itself. <laughs> they picked it back up and it seemed to be in shock and it curled up. But eventually it, it just kind of shrugged it off and seemed fine. And then we went to our walk down the the path with it and found a zoo employee because Bibby was, was like, if we can't let it go, it doesn't have its mom, it's going to die. So I was like, all right, I'll give it to a zoo employee instead of chucking it in the flamingo den or whatever (laughs) (laughs) um and uh and it took a while for so they called in like the 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 animal control person which i feel like every zoo employee should be an animal control person but there's apparently very specific people (laughs) for non-zoo animals zoo animals some of those (laughs) zoo employee like we the person that first approached us was later like serving us burgers so like there's a range of skills. <laughs> you kind of have to be like a, a a Jack or a Jane of all trades, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if Jane of all trades is the thing, but let's make it a thing. It should, um, you know what? It's 2022. We can have Janes of all things. Janes of, Janes of, all, all, uh, <laughs> of all trades. And, uh, and um, masters of none, but better than a master of one. Mistresses of none? Because mistress is the... Yeah yeah so i get yeah anyway so i'm holding this this baby squirrel um and it falls asleep in my hands and then and we're waiting for we're just standing in the path and waiting for the um specific employee that deals with animals at a zoo to show up um and then suddenly a bunch of like teenagers notice that i have a baby squirrel in my hand and then they all start like gathering around me there's like 20 people around me taking pictures um and the zoo employees are just standing there like yeah you're gonna be instagram famous (laughs) i I know there's lions like 20 (laughs) feet away from you (laughs) i know there's there's literally like 50 bright pink 
flamingos across the way from me. I'm not joking about the whole flamingo thing. That's that's much more interesting than a squirrel. Everybody knows what squirrels look like. Uh, but yeah, and th- and then eventually the person came and I I dropped the squirrel off and washed my stinking hands mm-hmm. and uh and then it rained for the rest of the day. But that was that's my animal encounter outside of all the, you know, zoo animals that were there. It was uh nibbling on you a little bit. I oh yeah. It, 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 it did not break the skin, but it was it was nipping. Um I think it was looking for food Another. or something mm-hmm. or milk or whatever. I didn't have any of that. <laughs> So but yeah, yeah. It, this, is, this is very cute. And the first time I've ever picked up a squirrel before or ever had a squirrel. I, that was probably the first time I've ever actually touched a squirrel, a living squirrel. That was a situation where it's like, what's the right thing to do here? Or what's the good thing to do? Because like you don't want to nor you normally don't. If you said, hey, should you touch a rodent? You should probably say no. No. But <laughs> this one particularly like seemed like it was in trouble. But yeah, it's like, do I put this back in the in the bush that it came out from and just be like, and then it just runs back out and somebody steps on it? Um, do I chuck it in the flamingo pen? Do I, <laughs> <laughs> what Give do I do? Monkey? If I put it down, base is just going to kick it again. So, <laughs> uh, do, yeah, do I give it to one of the monkeys? I think I made the right call though. Giving it to another person. Giving it to yes, a person that another human being that claimed to know what they were doing, but yeah, everyone was enthralled by the the sight of a squirrel in a zoo. <laughs> you paid money in here to see a, a, animals that you don't see every day. So t- so take a picture of the squirrel. Anyway, that's my animal encounter. Glad you were there for it, because <laughs> nothing interesting happens. Uh, that's the most interesting that's ever happened to me at any zoo. Let's talk about the major facts for the salamander. And we're I'm calling this uh, skin deep. Hmm. So despite being so big and normally the apex predator of its environment, the giant salamander needs to have some interesting adaptations to survive, namely in its skin. So for starters, so there's three major things that the salamander's skin does. Whenever they are threatened or injured, uh, the first thing is that they secrete a white slimy mucus that is rich in proteins and very uh viscous sticky and this allows them to a uh like if something is going to potentially cut them um it reduces that and also if they have been injured or cut or something like that it seals and heals let's seal and heal how is that not a mantra like at some sort of like pseudo spiritual getaway or something like that let's seal, seal and heal, heal. Don't um, know. <laughs> now they know. um so yeah it's it functions at, as a medical adhesive this this slime um and it has been actually proven to work in pigs and rats uh to 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 heal wounds it has a low risk of infection uh, and it actually reduces scarring at the end um, and researchers have even made a bioadhesive out of the salamander skin goo um, called SSAD I don't know seasonal effective super seasonal affective disorder um, but it's basically just the goo it's 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 the goo but it's freeze-dried um, and the plan is to develop it so that it can be used for uh, sutureless wound closures on humans in the future, um, possibly even used during surgeries on internal organ wounds. So um, sometimes in surgeries, um, well, I mean, a lot of times uh, in emergency surgeries, internal organs are damaged, but also during regular surgeries, Internal organs can be nicked or something like that. And this might be a very good thing to put on that. It's like the aloe vera of animal secretions. Um, so uh, the Chinese have actually been using this, using the salamander gunk to treat burns for over 1,500 years. So if you 
Yes, you. If you are injured in China and a giant salamander happens to be nearby, consider yourself lucky because there aren't very many of them. Um, but also, just slap some of that skin slime on and you should be right as rain. <laughs> so the first thing, that's the first thing that it does is it, it secretes the very, very good slime. Um, the second thing is that, this, this uh, like you said, they can't see very well. They have these beady little eyes um, that are lidless, but yet they... They they don't really rely on them. They their their eyesight is very poor. Um, so to compensate for that, their skin is lined with these special sensory nodes. Um, and so it it will, will depend on these sensory nodes to sense vibrations in the water um, that's around it, and that'll allow them to detect prey uh, by triangulating those vibrations. It'll also allow it to detect like other you know other things that are nearby and potential threats. Um, and so, yeah, it does, it doesn't look for its prey. It, it, it sends it's its prey using its skin. So it sees with its skin basically. Um, and then lastly, just like frogs can drink through their skin, giant salamanders have semi permeable uh, skin that allows oxygen to be absorbed from the, from the water. So they, they actually just, sp they, they, live their whole lives underwater and like you said as adolescents they have gills but as adults they don't have gills they have lungs um but rather than you know floating up to the surface to grab a, a gulp of delicious air um they just sit at the bottom of the river and absorb oxygen yeah via osmosis um just like I said, like amphibians uh, or like frogs can just drink by sitting in a puddle. Um, so yeah, the giant salamander just sits at the bottom of a river and it uses its skin to breathe, to see, and to heal itself. Pretty cool in my opinion. I think we did the axolotl and that is technically in related to salamanders. It's probably mm -hmm. the closest thing we've done to a salamander. And that thing can like regrow its head. So um, they're very good at healing. <laughs> But yeah, that's all I got. That's all I got. Um, all right, so that was the Chinese very big, giant, large Chinese salamander. Mm -hmm. um, f for you out there in podcastia, keep your skin slimy, blend in with your background, and absorb what you need via osmosis like the Chinese giant salamander here in life, death, and taxonomy. Hey Taxonomy Titans, I just want to remind you that we now have a Patreon. Patrons can see full video episodes and get shoutouts on the show. But ultimately, it's a way for you to help us cover some costs and get even better. Still, reviews are the best way to help us grow. So if you haven't left one yet, we'd really love to hear from you. As always, thanks for listening and engaging. podcast <laughs> <laughs> disgusting Bibby and I the, Bibby and I quote that all the time to each other is from uh, spirited away <laughs>